Let's open our Bibles this evening to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The title of the message tonight is The Christian's War, or The Christian's Warfare. We're going to look uh, at a couple of different things and aspects about the Christian's warfare uh, in this chapter. You know, the Christian life is not a resort, but a battlefield, or really a minefield, if you think about it. Um, I had never really been to a resort before 2019, and it was an opportunity uh, that I didn't even pay for. My wife and I were in the Dominican Republic in Puerto Plata on the North Shore visiting our missionaries, and uh, he, uh, um, the airplane actually had mechanical issues, and so uh, American Airlines said, we're going to put you up in a resort for a night. And um, it was very interesting because it was right across the street from um, where we had just been with the missionaries uh, at a restaurant, and they lived up the hill in a, in a, uh, a small subdivision there. But... Um, I will tell you, it's night and day going from inside to out or outside to inside that resort. Um, the poor people that live on the outside, it's, it's just completely uh, foreign to them. But sometimes we think about the Christian life, and I don't know about you when you trusted the Lord as your Savior. Uh, maybe somebody told you, hey, now that you know Jesus as your Savior, your life's going to be a bed of roses. There's not going to be any more problems. Well, uh, if you've been walking with the Lord for any time, you know that uh, the Christian life is a struggle. But with Jesus by our side and helping us and in, in carrying us through many circumstances, uh, we can make it through. The Christian life is a battlefield. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We are in a battle. Christ is our commander-in-chief, and he has already conquered the world, the flesh, and the devil through his death and resurrection. And we already, we can see, and we're going to see a little bit more tonight, we know who our enemy is, and God has given us the wherewithal to win by faith. So tonight I want to look at four different aspects of the Christian's warfare as we uh, go through our lives. First of all, in uh, verses 11 and 12, we will see who the enemy is. Uh, then uh, later on, verses 13 through 17, we'll talk about the equipment. Uh, verses 10, 18 through 20, uh, 10 and 18 through 20, we will see the energy that is needed. And then verses 21 through 24, the encouragement uh, in this battle. So let's start, first of all, looking at verses 11 and 12 to understand a little bit more about who the enemy is. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Who is our enemy? Well, we see right here in verse 11, uh, the end of the verse, we have the word devil. The devil is the leader of our enemy. In scripture, he's known by other names as well. He's known as Satan, the adversary. He's a deceiver, the accuser. He's the tempter. He's an assassin. He's a liar. He once showed up in the form of a snake. He once was the angel of light, Lucifer, a different name. And he is known as the God of this age. He is a formidable enemy. We'll see a little bit more about that in a minute. He has many, many helpers as well. We know them as the demons, those uh, that were fallen angels, those that rebelled against God and were cast out of heaven, a third of the angels. Those are his helpers. And they continue to blind the minds of those that do not know the Lord as their Savior. But they also help in the attacks against Christians. The enemy, Satan, has great abilities. He is a strong and formidable enemy. But the Bible is very clear that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. As we go through, we need to understand that we need the power of God in order to fight against this strong enemy. We must remember that we should never let down our guard. 
When we were uh, first in Brazil, I say first for my wife and children and uh, myself, I was a teenager in Brazil, spent four years there, learned Portuguese, and then God called me to go back uh, to Brazil. Um, and so we arrived in 2006 uh, in Sao Paulo, the biggest city in South America, about 25 million people or so. And um, we lived in the western suburbs at that point. And um, I remember... Uh, it was very unique because after deputation, I'd done a lot of the traveling the last year. My wife had just had our third child, uh, Caroline, and so I was doing a lot of the traveling then, and she was staying at home with the kids a, a good bit. But when we got to Sao Paulo, it became sort of a role reversal. Uh, I already spoke Portuguese, and uh, she didn't, and so we were living in the western suburbs, and she was going to need to go to language school uh, downtown Sao Paulo. So we actually uh, hired a young lady uh, from one of the churches nearby uh, that was established by Graham Foreign, uh, part of the team where Kelly Love has been working the, the past number of years. And um, we hired this young lady to ride with my wife every day. So they would get up early in the morning, they would go down to the bus station, and uh, it was about a 10-minute bus ride uh, to the train. They would get on this train, people packed in like cattle cars, and uh, about a 45-minute ride to the subway, and they would make the transfer to the underground metro. And it was about a 10-minute ride on the metro, and then a 10-minute walk to language school. So every single day, she was doing that trajectory back and forth. And... Um, so I was staying at home with the three little pigs. I mean, did I say that? The three little kids. <laughs> um, and our oldest was just starting kindergarten, so trying to get him into schooling and everything. So it was a little bit more difficult uh, for me, I think, even than her. But that's debatable. Of course, all that travel, I don't envy her that. But when she would get home every day, she was very tired from that experience. And uh, we had a VW bus uh, called a Combi. And it was not a hippie van, no peace signs or flowers painted all over it or anything, but it was in a blue-colored VW bus. And uh, my wife did not know how to drive a stick, a uh, manual transmission. And so with her being tired and everything, not knowing how to drive the VW bus, I would go out and do the grocery shopping once in a while. And I remember one particular day, uh, Barueri, the western suburb, there's a lot of hills there, and um, I would go out to go grocery shopping. And one particular day, I took the van out, or the VW bus out, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background on this VW bus, it didn't run just on gasoline, it ran also on natural gas. Uh, we had extra tanks in the back, the engine was in the rear, the extra tanks were above the engine. Uh, That's very popular in South America because natural gas is, a, is cheaper than gasoline, but it's also a weaker fuel to burn, so you burn more of it. And um, anyways, this particular day I was, I was going up a hill uh, to go grocery shopping and I was running on natural gas. And I started getting slower and slower as I was going up because it's a weaker fuel. And as I looked up at the top of the hill, there was a police blitz up there. And I'm thinking, oh dear, do I have my documents? And going through my mind, uh, do I have everything that I need? And as I was creeping up that hill and I didn't have enough uh, power, there's a little button that you can switch to gasoline, but you got to be moving a certain speed in order to do that. And I wasn't going fast enough. So I was trying my best to get to the top of the hill on this natural gas. And as I got to the top, the, one of the police officers stepped out in the road and motioned for me to pull over. And so I pulled over and <clears throat> I rolled the window down thinking they were going to ask me for my documents. Instead, the officer yelled at me in Portuguese, Desligue o motor e desce o veículo. Turn off the engine and get out of the car. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I set the parking brake, turned off the engine, got out of the vehicle. And then she yelled at me again in Portuguese, you know, get up on the side of the van and spread your arms and legs. <laughs> <laughs> and big old pat down. I'd never had that done before. And then she asked me for my documents, and she went back to her car. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on here? And uh, so there was another officer standing there, and I went over uh, to him, and I asked him, you know, what exactly is going on? And uh, he explained to me that there was a jailbreak, some prisoners of uh, this gang. The gang was called the PCC gang. Has nothing to do with Pensacola Christian College, okay? <laughs> totally different acronym in Portuguese. Um, 
So the PCC gang had escaped from uh, prison, and uh, these guards were uh, trying to find them. And they said, you know, we're staring at you through binoculars as you're coming up the hill. And you had this ve- larger vehicle and a plate that was from out of state. I actually had bought the vehicle in the place that we were going to be serving as missionaries and then brought it to Sao Paulo. And um, you were getting slower and slower coming up the hill. We thought maybe you were trying to avoid us. And they said, you know, we can't ever let down our guard. And I got to thinking, in our spiritual lives, that is true for us as well. We can never let down our guard. Satan knows our weaknesses, and he is going to be right there trying to attack us. He has uh, great abilities. He is astute. He's smart, but he's a thief, and he's a liar. I think about Satan coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God. He is God. And he was there at creation. He created the world. And Satan coming up to the Lord Jesus Christ, the audacity of saying to him, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. It all belongs to the Lord anyways. If Satan is willing to go to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ, who is sinless, how much more is he going to try to get at us? We cannot let down our guard. He is a strong and formidable enemy. How does Satan attack? Various ways. Some things are not quite as overt as what we saw in Brazil. I mentioned in Sunday school this morning about uh, spiritism. Uh, We lived in Porto Alegre in southern Brazil, just a small town of about three and a half million people, uh, small compared to Sao Paulo. (laughs) Um, But there were 3,000 spiritist centers in Porto Alegre. And we would see sacrifices on a regular basis, whether it was in the traffic circles with popcorn being scattered and bottles of wine, or maybe it was headless chickens or goats or basins of blood on the rocks along the river, the sacrifices that were made to the spirits. I remember one young man that was saved out of spiritism. And as, a, as an 18-year-old, he had made a pact with the devil in the cemetery, slit his wrists as best as he could not to die, but still just saying, Satan, I will serve you with my life. He came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior. Great transformation took place. He continued to be oppressed by the spirits, though. They would tr- try their best to make him depressed, and he would have up-and-down moments. I remember another man, I may have shared this in the past, I don't recall, but a man by the name of Gilberto was a spiritist witch doctor. This was a tall, thin, white-haired gentleman, same age as my dad, so he's 73 now, descendant of Italian immigrants. Doesn't fit that stereotype in your mind. But I remember him sharing his testimony with me, saying, yes, I was a spiritist, but I wasn't just a spiritist, I was a witch doctor. And he said, I would hold seances, And people would say that I was speaking in a voice that was not my own. It was the demons that were speaking through me. And I would uh, have this ability sometimes to feel people's pain. They would come to me. They would lay down on a table in front of me, and I would pass my hands over their body. And I could feel where their pain was. And in some cases, I could heal them from their pain. Just to share the rest of his testimony in, in a summary form. His wife and daughter, one day when he got home from the seance, uh, were out. And uh, they came back uh, later that evening, and he asked them, where were you? And they said, oh, we stopped at this little uh, church down the road. He said, oh, really? And they said, yeah, we learned about uh, Jesus. He said, you mean the butcher, Jesus? No, 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 different Jesus. This Jesus is the Son of God. And he said, I don't want to hear anything more about him. And so over the next few weeks, uh, the wife and daughter who had placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they were going to church. They were also doing a disciple-making program, uh, learning more about God and his word. And uh, Gilberto continued his seances. But he said he was watching his wife and daughter. And he noticed this transformation that was taking place in their lives, that their speech was different, their attitudes were, were different, their actions were different. And he said, that just really started resonating with me. Something is going on in their lives. And this incredible transformation that was taking place. 
And he said he started asking them questions about what they were learning, and they were sharing the gospel with him and sharing the Bible. And he said there was this wrestling match going on inside of him. He said, uh, I came to the point where it was so strong that I had to come to a, a conclusion. Who am I going to choose? Who am I going to serve? Am I going to continue to serve the dark side where I know I have power and I've seen this power? Or am I going to choose to serve this, this Jesus and come to the light where I've seen this incredible transformation take place in my wife and daughter? And he said, I chose the light. I chose Jesus Christ. And this man, I did not know him. He got saved before we got to Brazil. But they said he'd been a violent man. He could pick up one of these heavy chairs and sling it across the room in a fit of rage. But the man that I knew was a meek, mild man, one that loved the Lord. And he even enrolled in our Bible seminary to learn more about, even at the age of 60, about how to share the truths of the gospel. That's an overt form of how Satan works. We don't see a lot of spiritism here, open spiritism in America. But you know, each one of us has our weaknesses. We have our, our temptations that, are, uh, that we struggle with. But you know, Satan knows our weaknesses even better than we know our own weaknesses. We must be careful. We cannot let down our guard. We understand who the enemy is, but we move on in this chapter, Ephesians chapter 6, and we can see the equipment that is provided for us, the equipment, verses 13 through 17. Let's go ahead and read these verses. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We're not going to take the time this evening to look at each of the various aspects of the armament that is there. But I just want to point out a few things in these verses. First of all, in verse 13... Uh, Paul, the human author here of Ephesians, uh, writes, we are to take unto ourselves part of the armor of God. Is that what it says? I'm <laughs> just checking to see if you're awake. <laughs> what does it say? The whole armor of God. Okay, so that means every single piece is important in order to stand in this battle. We need every piece of the armor that God has provided for us. Why? As he goes on, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Question for you, when is the evil day? Today. Tomorrow. <laughs> what? This preacher's a doom and gloom guy. Evil days? Every day can be an evil day if we're not taking to ourselves the whole armor of God and standing in his power and in his might. We must stand. I like some of these uh, just to point out our loins are to be girt about with truth. Our loins is, are the midsection of our bodies, right? I've got a belt on. It's very important. It holds everything together in my clothing. And we think about truth. This is uh, integrity. It holds everything together. Very important. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This gives us stability and support as we go into the battle, as we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is our offensive weapon, this last one. And I would even uh, vie that um, verse 18, the first word there, prayer or praying, should also be included in our armament as an offensive weapon. We'll talk more about prayer in just a little bit. But every aspect of the armament is important. We need to be using every single piece that God has provided for us. How are we doing in this? Are we standing? Are we using the equipment that God has provided Yes, God knows our enemy is strong, but he's also provided us with this armament to be able to stand and to fight. As we go on in this chapter, we see the energy that is needed. Look at verse 10 and then verses 18 through 20. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then jump down to verses 18 through 20. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So the energy that is needed as we are in this battle, what exactly is the energy, this force, the strength, the power that is needed? How do we get this energy? It is through prayer, through prayer. Prayer is talking to God. God speaks to us through his word. We do not hear him speaking in audible voices or in handwriting in the sky now. But we talk to him in prayer, and he communicates to us through his word. We must continuously be seeking God's help as we are in this battle. Without him, we cannot stand. We will fall. We will be defeated. We need his strength and his power in order to stand. As it says in verse 10, we stand in the Lord. We are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I've never been in uh, the military. Do we have anyone here that served in any of the branches of the military? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I've read some books about battles, and of course you see movies and things. I'm sure those aren't exactly accurate uh, depictions, but can you imagine um, if there's a group of soldiers that are out on the front lines, and they're fighting in this warfare, and communications are cut off with headquarters? What would happen to that group of soldiers that are out there on the front line? They'd be in trouble, Right. That communication is vitally necessary for them to be able to survive. Uh, it allows them to be able to tell uh, headquarters what uh, ammunition is needed, uh, what food and supplies are needed, even a sense of direction where the enemy is. And if that line of communication is cut off, they are left out there pretty much to die. In our spiritual lives, how important prayer is our communication with headquarters. God wants to hear our prayers. He wants to meet our needs. He wants to help us. But we must be communicating with him. And if sin or Satan cuts off those lines of communication, we're in trouble. We need his power and his might in order to stand. It's interesting, uh, Paul talks about prayer here in verses 18 through 20. And the importance of prayer, he realized how important it was, so much so that he uh, is asking for the saints back in Ephesus to pray for him. But before that, he says in verse 18, we're to pray always with all prayer and supplication. This is being persistent, praying in everything, in all manner, in all times, in the Spirit, watching thereunto. This is being alert. We must be alert in the battle. But Paul goes on, and he is asking prayer uh, for him to have boldness. Now, I don't know about you, but as you read Scripture and you read the, the epistles and uh, the books that Paul was the human author of uh, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul did not strike me, does not strike me, as a weak individual, somebody that, um, did, that lacked in boldness. But he is asking the believers to pray for him to have boldness, to be able to share the truths of the gospel. Why is Paul asking them to pray for him to do that? Well, we have to understand the context. Where is Paul when he wrote the book of Ephesians? Prison, right? Look at verse 20. He says, I'm an ambassador in bonds. Paul was in prison. Now, prison back then wasn't the same as it is today. Not that it's any... Uh, fun place to be or nice environment today. But back then, from what I've read, it many times would be uh, underground, or it could have been like in a cave. It was very dark and uh, dank uh, place. And uh, from what I've read as well, the Roman guards would, uh, on eight-hour shifts, they would come and there would be a guard that was assigned to each prisoner. 
and not just assigned to watch over the prisoner, but they would actually bind themselves by on the arm, sort of like handcuffs. They didn't have handcuffs back then, but uh, maybe chains or something. Uh, they would bind themselves to the prisoner. So Paul in prison uh, uh, three times a day, he's got different soldiers that are bound to him. Uh, you may say that they were captive audiences, right, for him to share the gospel. But you got to think about these soldiers. Paul was wanting to share the gospel with them. It was the only audience he had at that moment. But what would happen if the soldier didn't like what they were hearing from Paul? Well, they had this thing called a short sword. And if the soldier didn't like what he heard, he could just easily pull that short sword out and end Paul's life. Paul was human. We see here his emotions in play. You know, I've always thought about Paul as the, uh, the super missionary, the missionator, or whatever you want to call him, this uh, super missionary that's uh, strong in, in all of this, yet here we see that he understood his own limitations, his own weakness. And yes, there was a sense of fear being there with those soldiers. He wanted to open his mouth boldly to make known the truths of the gospel to these, his audience at that point. And he is asking the believers in Ephesus, please pray for me that I will be able to do that. He even uses this word twice, 19 and verse 20, to speak boldly, to open my mouth boldly as I ought to speak. Prayer is so vitally important. We must not only be communicating with headquarters to understand, uh, to let headquarters know of our weaknesses, our struggles, and um, where we need help, but it's so important that we are sharing our prayer requests with one another as well, helping one another, lifting each other up before the throne of grace. And this leads us to our last point here in verses 21 through 24, the encouragement that is needed in the battle. It says here, But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. We must remember that we are not alone in the fight. There are others that are in the fight. Just look around you. Other believers that are in the fight. Maybe I should pause here and ask, are you on the winning side in this battle? Every single person in this world is in this battle, this spiritual warfare. The question is, are you on the Lord's side, or are you still serving your father, the devil, Satan? I invite you tonight, come to the winning side, come to the light, it's shining for you. But for those of us that are believers, yes, we have been saved, yes, uh, we know that we are on our way to heaven. But we still have this struggle, this fight that we are involved with. We are not alone in the battle. Paul here mentions a man by the name of Tychicus in verse 21. We don't know a whole lot about him. Uh, he says, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. It's very possible that Tychicus was uh, one that was saved under the ministry of the apostle Paul. So he could have been a son in the faith. But this Tychicus uh, was from Ephesus, and um, I can, uh, you know, maybe I'm embellishing and imagining in my mind here, but Ephesus wasn't very close to where Paul was in prison. Um, it wasn't a matter of Tychicus uh, just saying, hey, I'm going to go pay Paul a visit, hop on an airplane and be there in an hour and a half, or even hop in his car and be there in five or six hours. We're talking a couple of weeks journey for Tychicus to get to visit the Apostle Paul. This Tychicus, I'm sure he had a job. He had a family, probably. He would leave his family behind. He may have even had to give up his employment to go see the Apostle Paul. But he wasn't going just as, as his own, on his own accord. He was going as an emissary from the church in Ephesus. The people there 
the church that Paul helped establish, they wanted to know how Paul was doing. So they were behind Tychicus, and they're saying, okay, go, Tychicus, we'll, we'll give you supplies and, you know, um, tell Paul how we're doing when you get there. Share the news about the church and how things are going here. And so I can imagine the Apostle Paul, you know, being there in this uh, dark prison and very damp uh, prison and probably even feeling a bit of despair, loneliness, didn't know hardly anybody that was around him, not that there were a lot of people there visiting him. But I can imagine Paul one day lifting up his eyes. He heard maybe the gate clang shut, and he looked up, and there's this Tychicus, this friend of his, a fellow minister in the Lord. And Paul's face would light up and say, wow. It's so good to see you. I haven't seen you in forever. And, and now I'm in this prison for preaching the gospel and to see a face that I know, one that I love. Tychicus coming and bringing news of the people from the church in Ephesus. And then, of course, after a, a, a time of being there, he would return to the church with news about the Apostle Paul. Now, by the time Tychicus got back to Ephesus, it's very possible that Paul could have been dead. Um, but at the same time, he was there as an encouragement to the Apostle Paul with news from afar. Paul understood the importance of faithful friends in the Lord, those that were in the battle as well. Tychicus was there to encourage the Apostle Paul. How often we need encouragement as we are in this spiritual battle. You know, many times I feel like um, we struggle maybe with some sort of uh, temptation or issue in our lives, and we say, you know, I just can't seem to get the victory over this, and nobody knows the troubles I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. Well, it's good that Jesus knows your struggles, but let me tell you, there are others around you that have either gone through the same struggle, or maybe they're currently in that same struggle. And we're to be an encouragement one to another, lifting one another up in this battle. Once again, alluding to physical warfare, you look at um, or read about uh, warfare in the past and how the soldiers would lock arms as they would advance against the enemy. And as some of those men would fall, there were others that would jump up in the gap and, and continue that line moving forward. But if more and more fell... And these soldiers would look around them and say, you know what? I'm kind of left here as a sitting duck. There's nobody else beside me. I'm going to turn tail and I'm going to retreat. So it is in spiritual battle as well. If we feel like we are uh, alone, we are out there by ourselves, and we do not look at those that are serving alongside of us, we will become discouraged and we will want to turn and retreat. We need to be encouraging, lifting up one another as we go into this battle and this fight. Paul uses words here like peace, love, faith, and grace. These are all riches that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. The battle is great, but our commander-in-chief has already won the battle. We must rely on his strength as we move forward. We must be using the equipment that he's provided. We must be uh, getting the energy, the power, the strength from him that we need to stand. And we need to be encouraging one another as believers to continue to press on. But not just for the sake of defending ourselves and our faith, but seeking to rescue others from the other side, to bring them over to the winning side. How are we doing in this battle? Are we giving in to the temptations of our enemy? Or are we standing in the power of the Lord in the power of his might? Are we encouraging one another as we move forward in this battle? One of my favorite songs growing up was 570. You don't need to turn there. I'm not going to sing for you, I promise. I want you to stay here through the end of the service. <laughs> um, faith is the victory. I just want to read through the, the verses here. Um, this song dealing with the Christian warfare. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe and veils below, let all our strength be hurled. 
Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road the saints above with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then upward from the hills of light, our hearts with love of flame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, O oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. How is your faith tonight? Is it strong? You know, so often I think in our Christian lives, we kind of put things in cruise control mode and think, you know what, everything is just moving along fine. I'm, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. You know, I, I serve the Lord every now and then. Everything's good. And we just cruise right along. But we are in a battle and we must remember that we cannot be neutral in this battle. I once read a book as well as a, when I was a kid. Uh, it was called An Upstream Christian in a Downstream World. You're moving. You're not being stagnant. You're either moving forward for the Lord or you're moving backwards. How is it in your life today? May the Lord help us to remember that we are in a battle and we must continue to fight until he either sends his son to call us home in death or, or in, until he either calls us home in death or until he sends his son to rapture his church up to be with him for all eternity. May the Lord help us to continue to be faithful to shine the light of the gospel until that time comes. There are so many that are lost and dying and going to hell each day around us. Are we sharing the truths of the gospel with them? Are we seeking to see them come to the winning side? May the Lord help us to be faithful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your love for us. We thank you for that great love that you sent your Son, your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus, to come to this earth, to die on the cross for our sins. Father, we're, we are not worthy of your mercy and grace in our lives. And so often we fail and we stumble, but you are a faithful God that forgives us when we confess our sins and that you plant our feet on a rock. And Father, as we think about our lives, our lives are not our own. We belong to you. We've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed to pay for our sins. And Father, I pray that our lives would reflect our gratitude to you for that sacrifice of your son on the cross for us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to continue to spread the news of the gospel to lost souls around us. Lord, we look at the Apostle Paul and his prayer for boldness, and he was literally in danger of his life. But Father, we are not in danger of losing our lives for sharing the truths of the gospel. Yet we sit back many times complacent, and we don't even think about the lost state of those around us. Father, I pray that you would convict us of this sin. Help us, Lord, to be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, to share the truths of the gospel with lost souls around us. Yes, it's important to see lost people come to know you around the world, but how much more in our own Jerusalem, our own Judea, our own America, our own country. Lord, I pray that you would help us to reflect upon the mercy and grace that has been bestowed on us and help us, Lord, to give our lives back as living sacrifices that are holy, pleasing, acceptable in your sight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.